Hello, my beautiful friends. Welcome back to the show. Today, I'm super excited to dive into today's conversation with Katie Mary. She's a tenacious visionary with big ideas. Katie is a passionate artist and conservationist who truly loves her work. She's always creating, forever a student, and brimming with wanderlust. Drawing on her decade of experience in fashion and editorial photography, Katie's known for natural, ethereal, painterly portraits and capturing fleeting moments that seem to free both time and emotion. She runs in every city she visits and has never met a dog she didn't like. I am so excited to dive into today's conversation. I have been literally stalking her on social media probably for years now. So it is such a delight to have her on the show. So welcome, Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome. And I'm so excited to be here and, and chatting with you. So tell us who you are and what you're really passionate about. Oh, my goodness. Um, well, I mean, at my core, um, I am definitely a uh, creative. I, I love creating. I love capturing beauty. I've been in the photography industry now for over 20 years, wow. capturing luxury destination weddings around the world for the last 15. And as you mentioned, I am also very, very passionate about uh, our planet, about yeah. conservation and about animals, um, whether that's threatened wildlife or uh dogs, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm a big dog lover, um, but really love the animal world and uh, love to bring those passions together anytime that I can bring together uh, my, my passion for creating as well as my passion for um, providing positive impact, impact in that section of the world. I love that so much. I think that's so important. You know, like we... <laughs> I I love hearing about conservationists because it is, it's so important. We take for granted this planet and as a photographer, like you really are seeing the beauty of it and how, you know, as as 20 years, even locations, Mm -hmm. how we're just messing things up. So I love that you're just taking a stand and that's something that's passionate for you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a lot of fun to bring those worlds together. Yeah. So can you tell a little bit about your experience as an editorial photographer? Because I really think that's a dream for so many of our listeners. And I think they would love to understand maybe, number one, the process and what it's really like and where to even start. So sorry, that was probably three questions all wrapped in one. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, with my background in fashion photography, that is really where I started. So I started working for fashion photographers, which was everything from Uh, shooting catalog in Miami to working on ad jobs to working on editorial shoots for publications and magazines. And obviously I was, I was more on the photographer's team. So I was an assistant. Um, I even helped assist some fashion stylists from time to time. And later as kind of, we went from film to digital in that sector of the world, I ended up becoming a digital tech. And so that that arena is really rooted in my background. And so when I started to go into weddings, what you do when you're a budding fashion photographer is you test, um, which essentially means you get together your creative friends, you get a model, you get some fashion, you make pictures. Um, so really when I started to tiptoe into the wedding waters, I essentially started to do the same thing and go about it the same way, which I got together some creative friends, got some models, got some fashion, um, used some locations that I had already been working at for years and just started to create what really was my portfolio, but also, you know, showing the world, showing clients what I could create. And I've, you know, started that process when I began in weddings and still to this day do that. And of course, over the years, uh, the goal and, and sometimes what has happened is then having somebody see that and going, great, now we want you to do that for, you know, this line of our designs or for this lookbook or things like that. So I definitely still create on my own um, the same way that I did back then, working with other creatives and and testing and kind of showing um, some aspirational portfolio content. But also uh, from time to time, I've had the pleasure of then being hired by designers or publications as well. Oh, so cool. So what made you make the switch of wanting to go into the wedding genre as well as editorial and fashion? Yeah, it was, it was really interesting. And I think definitely wasn't something that I was intentionally seeking. Um, but I did decide, you know, at some point I really needed to be shooting for myself. Uh, I think one of the downsides of being a professional photo assistant is that a lot of photo assistants or digital techs 
don't get behind the camera as much as, mm. as they would like. So I definitely was falling into that rut a bit by the end of my tenure of being a photographer's assistant. And so definitely getting back behind the camera was important. And I began associate shooting and second shooting for other wedding photographers as a way to kind of just gain some more experience as well as, you know, earn more money. And through that process, as well as one of the fashion photographers that I was working for had the idea that we create kind of a side company of fashion photography for weddings. Uh, I think we did one wedding together before he threw up his hands and said, this is the most <laughs> horrible thing I've done. I will never do this again. And I was looking at him going, I really don't think it's that bad. So, <laughs> so it kind of piqued my interest. And I also, at this time, the, the industry, the world, um, this was right when blogs were being born, when yeah. Style Me Pretty came on the scene, things were really changing and, yeah. and moving from church basements with white tablecloths to barns and mason jars and, you know, yes, whatever it was. Totally. <laughs> so, totally. Um, so, you know, and at the time that was really exciting. And I mean, look at where we've come since then. So, yeah. um, you know, weddings really started to morph and shift. And I think that really opened up a whole new realm of possibilities in terms of the photography related to yeah. weddings as well. Yeah. I love that. Now you have worked with some pretty big name celebrity clients as well. So can you share a little bit maybe on your experience, how different it is maybe working from a lesser known client and what to expect if someone wants to? Yeah. And I think every circumstance is different, surely. Yeah. Uh, but in general, the real high level differences often are that the more high profile an event, the more um, kind of celebrity or anything like that notoriety that comes with it, often um, the the level of details is is exponentially better, you know, and and wonderful to capture. However, the amount of time that you have to do it, or the logistics involved, or the other photo teams, or whatever that may be, the other press, you know, that also is exponentially usually yeah. more complicated as well. So it's kind of one of those that you go, gosh, there's there's really no like, oh, it's bad or good. It, yeah. It's really kind of evens out in the sense that there often is so much beauty to capture, um, but you just sometimes have to jump through a few more hoops to be able to get get what you would normally be able to get with a couple that says, oh, no worries, we'll just give you an hour to take portraits. And, yeah. you know, you're the only photography team and you don't have to worry about any of that. So um, there's pros and cons, surely, to both sides. Um, yeah, definitely. Now, you have uh, had travels, amazing travels with your photography career. Have you, What would you say has been your favorite location to shoot at? Oh, goodness. Um, well, one near and dear to my heart, and I've been there for many shoots now from both client and kind of on the passion project side is Africa. We actually just got back from Africa after our first time going back since COVID. And yeah. um, we're already plotting our return. So it's somewhere that I love to shoot. We've we've gone there. I have a passion project called Render Loyalty where we're partnered with several conservancies there and, mm -hmm. and photograph the animals that they protect and sell large format prints to raise awareness as well as raise financial support for them. So, so we go back and do that, but also have photographed for safari companies. We've gone there with clients and done anniversary sessions, kind of more editorial inspired and yeah. even climbed uh, Kilimanjaro with clients. So we've been there on um, a lot of different types of assignments, but it's a, a really dynamic continent. Um, there's a lot of it that I still haven't explored. Um, so it's always wonderful to get back to the countries there. I love that. Speaking of Kilimanjaro, I, that's incredible. Like, congratulations. Have you seen the Netflix show about that fellow that has climbed all the mountains? Is it is it the Explorer one? Oh, gosh, I can't even remember his name because he, he, he wanted to do it within a certain window of time to be like the first guy that did all 14, I think. Oh, maybe I'll send you one. the link. Okay. You probably yes. love it. It was yeah. so good. Oh. Well, it was interesting because after we did it, I worked together with my husband and business partner, Chad. And after we did that, he was like, okay, which mountain's next? And, you know, you kind of come up and I, I kind of was like, no, I think I'm, I'm, I'm okay for a while. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> and so it. it was, it was definitely an experience, um, and something that I was grateful that I did, that I wasn't racing yeah. up the next mountain, um, quite as quickly as he wanted to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So circling back a little bit to photography, can we talk maybe about photographer's biggest fear, raising our prices? So what mindset shifts do you feel photographers might need to make to see their value and confidently 
change and raise their prices? Well, here's how I've approached it, and it has helped me over the years. And trust me, I've been there. Um, <laughs> I definitely have felt those insecurities and yeah. that I'm never going to work again feeling. Um, and how I've approached that is kind of counterbalance, if you will, in the sense that really intentionally and with a, a really deep commitment to investing in myself and my growth and continuously pushing myself beyond my comfort zone. And so that's yeah. where a lot of those editorial shoots come in that, you know, there's a lot of lighting things or, or different styles that that's a really great place to explore and push yeah. yourself creatively. So I've definitely done that over time where if I look back and look at the version of myself two years ago, I go, wow, we've really come a long way and yeah. I've really grown a lot since then. And I feel I've elevated my work and my craft as well as um, myself as an entrepreneur and what I offer clients in terms of value and client experience. And so when we're being proactive on that side and, and not just hoping that we're getting better, but actually truly taking action to make it happen, I think it's a lot easier to go, well, of course I have to raise my rates, A, otherwise you can't make those investments yeah. in yourself. And and especially nowadays with, um, yeah. with just even inflation and, yeah. and the way that our world is trending, if we're not doing that, we're surely going backwards. So yeah. um, I think it's one of those that um, stepping more into those shoes of I am an entrepreneur. I am running a business that being profitable is one of the most important aspects of it, as well as creating amazing work and, and over delivering to our clients. But I think that approaching it from that standpoint makes it a non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. which is really um, sets you up in a good spot to make sure that you keep growing. Yeah, I love that. I think that's one thing that was a mistake like that I made in the beginning years was like paying myself. Mm -hmm. Like, right? Like as a photographer, especially I'm a maternity newborn photographer, I was taking all of my income and reinvesting it. Right. Not really paying myself. So it was like right. there was that huge sort of disconnect of actually taking it seriously as a business. And I went, eventually, I, of course, raised my prices and I'm at a level now where I am making a living wage with that company. But it's like you, when you start your photography business, you don't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I think so much of the time we're just so passionate about creating. And I know I certainly mm -hmm. was. I was like, the photos feed me, you know, like, <laughs> it feeds my soul. Like, yeah. It was, yeah. was really great until, you know, that bill comes and you're like, yeah. Oh yeah. Like it doesn't feed the mortgage or no. you know, whatever. So, <laughs> um, so I think there is that. And I, I always try to instill in the creative entrepreneurs and the photographers that we work with who are, you know, climbing the ranks as, as we yeah. did, you know, don't wait for that crisis of, Oh my gosh, you know, I can't literally feed myself and my family. And so now I need to freak out and do something about it. Instead, yeah. you know, from day one, go, this is a business, you know, yeah. know your numbers. Am I being, am I profitable right now? Am I not? What are, get, get the education to close those knowledge gaps and, and yeah. really look to those who have gone before you and kind yeah. of already figured that out and can save yourself a lot of those kind of near crisis moments where you think that's it. I've got to go work for, you know, yeah. FedEx. I love FedEx, but you know. I know. <laughs> or like run like a million mini sessions at a hundred dollars yes. each. You're just like, no, honey, you don't yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah. And, and thinking long term. And I think that yeah. is, um, as an industry, something that is probably one of the most dynamic problems in our industry is it's very short sighted. And yeah. if you look, um, I think I was reviewing the statistics the other day and it's only about 22% of photographers that make it past 11 years in the market. Wow. Um, so when you really look at the numbers and, and that's, you know, we already know statistically most small businesses don't make it past five. And yeah. so when we look at all that data, it is telling us that we're, we're not, you know, being able to create a business that's able to meet our needs and our, our lifestyle yeah. and our financial needs, as well as something that is sustainable. And yeah. so that's really the goal is how do we ensure that we're really kind of intentionally looking ahead without overwhelming but also, you know, creating optimism for that future and having a plan to how we're going to create that. Yeah, I love that. So can you share maybe a tip on the dreaded inquire and ghost? Any <laughs> tips on how to how to convert those inquiries actually into bookings? Yeah, well, um, I know there's there certainly is a lot of the ghosting out there. And <laughs> I think that's Part of that is we just need to prepare for some of that. And, you know, it's a little bit like we are going into a field where getting a lot of no's, it's like being an actor, um, yeah. having a lot of people say, not you today, 
not you today. It's inevitably just comes with the job. Even Brad Pitt gets turned down by, you know, people sometimes like not you, Brad. Um, So I think it's just part of the territory and and some of that we just kind of need to just be at ease with and find a way to have a good relationship with that. And in terms of, you know, practicality, uh, I've talked for a long time and had the pleasure of kind of testing this out inside our community, inside the education that we do. Um, in for KT Mary education and really trying out this philosophy, which is I really feel strongly that uh, doing proposals over packages. And obviously, this is a little bit different if you're in the newborn and portrait space, but, you know, primarily talking about like either more high ticket portraits or weddings and kind of that engagement world, um, really moving away from a package list and instead doing calls, doing custom proposals. and, And that whole process in my mind is one of the best transitions that we've seen photographers make, uh, regardless of price point, regardless of years of experience, that the sooner that they can start doing that, uh, you're being, once again, more proactive, more intentional, having more communication, and really setting the stage that you're a high-touch yeah. vendor, uh, that you're really going to guide them and, and be the expert in the experience. So that is the one thing that I've really leaned into and we've seen a lot of our students have a lot of success with. And so for anyone that's interested, we break that down in like a A to Z process. Here's every step of the way, because a lot of people go great, but you know, how do you really do that? Um, I'm not sure what that looks like. So um, that's something that we've definitely broken down and, and seen work really well. And certainly you're gonna have a few people that are gonna ghost you and not wanna get on a call, but usually that tells you right there, um, you know, they might just be Mm -hmm. kind of shopping around or budget wise, you're not in alignment and there's, you know, we need to send them somewhere else anyhow. Yeah. It's funny in the, in like in the industry and in like, I've been, I used to be a wedding planner and an event planner and I would like clients would call or, and I worked at a conference center, um, at the university. And it was so funny because as soon as an inquiry came through, I would get on the phone and have a chat with the clients. But it's funny, as soon as like social media or texting or email, like it, we almost hide behind, yes. hide behind, like instead of like having that high touch experience, it's so easy just to hide behind it. So mm-hmm. how, what, like how, for someone who may be like uncomfortable getting on the phone, how would you encourage them to connect with their clients like that? Well, you need it even more than the people <laughs> that are comfortable. That's what I'll tell yeah. you. That. And that's, and that is the truth. Anywhere that you go, oh gosh, this, this really doesn't feel, and, and it's a good thing. We, I think we can all agree the more we can get in rapport with our clients, the more we can flesh out yeah. any areas of red flags or disalignment or anything like that, mm-hmm. it's going to benefit us both. So if we know it's good, but we're uncomfortable with it, we also know that, you know, the more you ride your bike, the better you get at it or yeah. really anything. And so I just go, you know, rip off the Band-Aid, um, get on those calls and, and learn, you know, go out and like yeah. that. Like I mentioned, we kind of guide people through that as well. But the more you can just say, I'm just really looking to hear from you. And, and really, when we're doing a good job of this, we're, we're being very active listeners. Yeah. So while we're asking really good questions, we're not sitting up there and giving a speech or a monologue or anything like that. So I think that also helps take the pressure off that it's not that you need to have a 17, you know, point PowerPoint presentation Mm -hmm. or anything. People really want to be able to tell you about what they are looking for, what's important to them um, and how you can help them. Yeah. I love that. I remember one time when I was first getting started in in this, this conference center role, um, it's, it was my boss had said, you know what, you have to look at it from two different ways. Either you're making a sales call or you're making a connection call. Yes. Yes. So it's like, if you look at it from the different angle of, instead of trying to sell someone to come and have their wedding and spend, you know, $20,000 with us, it's a connection call to find out exactly what they want. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I, I know once, once we did that, I was like, Oh, I can get on the phone now. So like, I can connect Great with advice. people. That's great. <laughs> and we really do that as well of, of, even if it becomes apparent, you know, and sometimes literally they'll say two sentences and I'm like, Oh, oop, nope, this isn't, yeah. you know, a good fit. Yeah. And but then you go, okay, well, you know, tell me about your budget. Tell me about what you're looking for. And because I, I happen to know a lot of photographers, I know a yeah. lot of people who have different strong suits and that's something that I'd be more than happy to provide you with a recommendation. And yeah. you're going to, you're going to make them feel that they were assisted and guided and, and really give them some 
really sound advice because you're not benefiting from it, but also such an important aspect that I think so many photographers are overlooking is the ability to support their fellow photographers and to refer business and to recommend someone where even if even if you don't directly know them or you're great friends, you just go, I, I see the work that they do. And gosh, what you're describing sounds just like that person. And, you know, I'd love to have you send them your way and, you know, reach out to that person and say, this person's looking in this range, you know, would you, I'd love to send them to you. And, and that's how you build connection with your community as well. And uh, I would love, love, love when we can, as a group of creative entrepreneurs, continue to raise the bar in the industry and help each other out. That goes a long ways. Oh, preaching to the choir. I love that so much. I love that. That's great. Yeah. So I'm going to be totally honest. Time management is probably my kryptonite. I get oh. easily distracted and I often find myself down a rabbit hole or maybe on TikTok um, instead of on a focused task. So what tricks or tips might you have to manage time a little bit more effectively and stay on track? Well, I've got a book for you, first and foremost. Um, so remind me, and I'll get that over to you. But it's called The One Thing. Have you read that? Oh, you know what? I have two hobbies. One is buying books, and one is reading books. <laughs> <laughs> so is it in the stack that you've read? Or it's in the, the, stack, it's in the stack It's in the stack to come. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So you, osmosis, it's been in your presence. Yeah, you've absorbed yeah, some of it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, great. Well, it is, I mean, it's truly one of those books that, really shifted this for me. And while I am not always the perfect um, person embodying the principles of the one thing, it is something that I come back to time and time Mm -hmm. again. And in short, it is about really getting focused on those priorities, about really um, setting up time blocks uh, and being able to control that calendar. So if we are saying that this one project is the chief priority, then for me, my most effective way of being able to do that is I do that first thing in the morning before anything mm-hmm. else when the world is still silent. So it usually means an early morning getting that done and then, you know, diving into the day. But I find that as they say, there's too many landmines, you know, whether that's, yeah, we all have different ones, you know, your children coming in your yep. door or <laughs> your phone buzzing or, you know, that notification or another email or a phone call, whatever it may be. Um, so I think it definitely is a book that really helped narrow that focus for me. I love it. I'll definitely check it out. Yeah. The time <laughs> blocking, say, time blocking, time is blocking, the best. time blocking. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Love it. That's great advice. So we often hear about our students working with clients that may not be their dreamy or ideal clients. Mm-hmm. So what advice do you have to attract and keep clients that you're excited to serve? Yeah, well, the very first thing in doing that is really knowing who that is Mm -hmm. um, inside and out. And I think a lot of the times we have an idea or we have some like nice to haves or we look at other people's clients and go, oh, that one looks good. Um, But in actuality, you know, it might be, uh, you know, the grass is greener situation. But for you, that might not be the great fit. So number one is spending a lot of time really just getting to know who that ideal client avatar, or as we like to say, community, you know, really is because in my case, I'm working with people from all over the world, clients in LA or New York or Hong Kong. And while they, they definitely do have a lot of differences from culture to, to race, to every, you know, where they live, everything. Um, when we really distill it down, there's a lot of commonalities and, and most of our clients are well-educated. Um, most of them have very successful careers are really um, have deep family relationships and, and a lot of strong family structure. They're usually really well traveled and, and love food and experiences and, mm-hmm. and like luxury, but not, you know, over the top fussy luxury. And so, you know, there's these certain commonalities where you can start to really kind of pull that out. And the more that you can really understand that client and their desires and their fears, uh, the more you can speak to it, whether that's in your marketing or that discovery call. And so, I think that's one of the first things is for people to really sit and give that some thought time. And um, Mm -hmm. we've done things with our students in the past of, you know, really building out like that vision board for that or writing out some of those ideas. And I think that just like that is important for us with our own dreams. I think it's really important to do with our clients. I love that. That's a great idea. Mm hmm. A 
Okay, so I want to circle back a little bit to the thought on the vision board, because I think with our sure. businesses, it's it's easy to start, but it's really a lot harder to stay on track with yeah. your consistency for your business. So do you have any advice on maintaining that passion and that drive and that consistency um, through it? Yeah, and one of the, the chief things, and I had to take my own advice, I think sometimes we teach the things that we need to hear the most. <laughs> yep. um, but, you know, we talk a lot inside our community of you don't need to be at the starting line to start taking action on some of your mm -hmm. bigger dreams. So whether that's um, buying, you know, say a commercial studio or in my case, someday having some type of animal sanctuary or something like that, I don't have to be at the place where I'm ready to buy the land and go rescue the animals. Um, and what I mean by that is what I set a, a goal this year was just, I'm going to have conversations with other people who have already done this. And I'm just mm -hmm. going to simply get on the phone and go someday in the future. I'm not sh exactly sure when I'd like to do this. I'd love to hear about your experience and, and just kind of hear about that process and how you went about it and things like that. So, you know, really starting to take some of those initial action steps ahead of being totally ready to do that thing, I think is one of the most important things. And it starts to make it more exciting, often more real, because yeah. sometimes these goals or dreams that we have, we have them so lofty in our minds and so complicated that actually when you start to take action on them, you're like, oh, maybe it's a little yeah. closer than I thought or yeah. a little less complicated. So I think that's one of the biggies is just um, not waiting to start doing even the smallest action, even if it's just research or mm -hmm. connecting with people. I love that. That's great advice. I think um, overthinking is probably yeah. what I get stuck in. And it's mm -hmm. like, instead of just starting and taking imperfect action, it's just exactly right. It's it, don't get stuck in your head guys. <laughs> well, and because you know, anytime you're in that thought loop, you're just adding to, Oh my gosh, well, it could be this, could be that, could yeah. be that you know, and, yeah. and surely it could be, but I think, um, I think if you can just get started a little bit, it's so much better. True. So are you ready for our lightning round? Oh, I love lightning rounds. Okay. Most luxurious vacation you've ever been on? Well, this is a, a hard one <laughs> because I, I spent a couple days in between jobs in the Maldives and um, Maldives are pretty luxurious mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. you're, they're luxurious when you're working and they're even more luxurious when you're not working. Yeah. Um, so that was pretty amazing. But as I mentioned previously, we just came back from Kenya yeah. And we're in a remote part of, of Savo East National Park and at a private camp where it was just my husband, my dad, and my uh, and myself and um, out there photographing elephants. And um, it was what I would call maybe kind of like wild luxury in the sense, mm. you know, open air and, and all yes. the beautiful things. Um, but it was probably my version of the most luxurious place, um, combined with that. just, you know, feeling very grounded and, and close to nature and, and really wild mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm, I love that. Like earth luxurious. I love it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that was a new standard. Yeah. Sorry. That, that wasn't very lightning of me, but <laughs> that's all right. These don't have to be lightning. It's <laughs> they're just random. <laughs> what was your favorite TV show as a kid? Oh, well, um, who's the boss, um, mm -hmm. for anyone old enough to remember that. And then, you know, it's kind of morphed over and translated from like being a young adult to, I guess, just forever would be friends. Oh, it's so true. Yeah. Gosh, I remember Friday, like I think it was Thursday nights or Friday nights. I can't remember. Oh, but we'd all Thursday. get together yes. yes, after school and we'd be like, yes. <laughs> yeah, so good. Oceans or mountains and why? Um, well, I, I, I guess I would say oceans, um, in the sense that, um, I live near the ocean now. And I think that I love visiting the mountains, but I love being able to dive into the ocean as often yeah. as possible. Love it. What's your favorite movie? Ooh, um, well, it's an old school one and it was one as a kid, so I'll still claim it, but wild hearts can't be broken. Oh, that yeah. was such a good one. Such a good one. Yeah. <laughs> it's an oldie. Yeah. What are three things you want to be remembered for? Oh, um, I think 
being able to create and capture beauty, be able to create a, a legacy um, and create lasting impact that lives on beyond me, um, even after I'm not here anymore. Mm, love that. Favorite guilty or not so guilty pleasure? <laughs> Sorry, someone's trying to get a hold of you. <laughs> <laughs> Stop this. There we go. <laughs> Um, so let's see. So favorite guilty pleasure would be, um, a dirty martini. Nice one. <laughs> yeah. When do you feel most authentically yourself? Um, for me, I think that is going for a run with my dog or yeah. being outside anything where I'm outside in nature moving. Love it. Mm -hmm. What are you most grateful in this season of life? Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for the ability to continuously dream up something and then bring it into reality. And I think I've worked for a long time and like many people, sometimes you can feel like you're, you know, never reaching, um, the apex of that hill that you've been climbing up. And so it has been fun to see some of these things come to fruition or, um, you know, some of that, that longstanding work, um, continue to evolve into something else. And so that's, that part is really mm -hmm. exciting about the possibilities to come. Love that. What makes your soul light up? Um, I would say nature and animals. Um, yeah. to me, there is nothing better than really being in the middle of nature, surrounded by animals or capturing that beauty of kind of our wild world. And, and learning about that, I feel like I want to turn into like a seven-year-old scientist to learn about every little thing out there um, because it really, truly is fascinating and just reminds us that there's so much we don't know. So much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. So can you share a little bit about your program, The Abundance Plan, and why you built the program and how it's helping your students? Yeah, absolutely. So this program... Um, with something that kind of was a, a passion project that came out of being going to conferences, speaking at workshops and things like that, and really just feeling a little um, almost frustrated that I wasn't yeah. able to dive deeper and really go to the core, that we were really skimming the surface. We were giving, you know, some inspiration and aspiration, but really also not providing the depth of what people really need to make lasting transformation. And so I decided that if I was going to ever create education, that it was going to be intentionally robust, intentionally down deep um, to the foundations yeah. from the inside out of building what you need and, and really all the things that I wish I had had at year one, year three, year five of my business. And so all those things that I, the questions I wish I had been asking myself earlier on or diving into the business foundations that could have saved me a lot of headache and all yeah. of those types of things. So now we have a very robust um, online program for photographers and creative entrepreneurs that we open up twice per year and bring them in and, and guide them through this curriculum. And like I said, it's A to Z, everything that yeah. I've used to build and run my business as well as continue to find a way to evolve as a creative maker and to continue to grow as an artist. And um, so it's a program that uh, a lot of photographers and creative entrepreneurs have been yeah. through now, and it's been really fun to see the transformations that have come out of that and um, how many people have evolved past just, you know, it's just taking pictures or just making yeah. money. It's it's really, you know, a deeper soul mission of, of how we're spending our lives and yeah. making that really count. Love that. Can't wait. We'll definitely include that link in the show notes for you yeah. guys. Yeah, thank you. So I love that you also have your five must do's for your morning routine. I wrote, I read that on your blog. Oh, so cool. can you share the importance of why having a solid morning routine or habits can really benefit your business and your life? Oh goodness. Well, I can't begin to speak to, and I test it all the time. I'll tell you that because <laughs> I'll, you know, have the solid morning routine. And yeah. I, like many people, <laughs> I've been traveling like a bug this year and all over the place. And so I'll derail from that. And sure enough, slowly, not as much as get, getting done. I'm not feeling as great, yeah. you know, whatever that may be. And um, I think the things that I found that I've committed to and as crazy as things can get, when I take the time for the few things in the morning that really set me up for success, or I know I really need as a person to, to feel that 
I'm healthy, I'm moving in the direction, I'm, I'm waking up positive and, and having an optimistic outlook um, no matter what comes my way, that morning routine is really what that what does that. And for me, you know, getting up, just doing those things of um, spending a little time, uh, giving your mind some space, always, you know, moving the body no matter what, even if yeah. it's, you know, 30 minutes of a video on the iPhone, whatever it may yeah. be, um, all those things really, really help me to feel that I'm starting the day right, that I'm that I'm taking care of my brain, my body, um, and able to show up for the other people in, in the business and all the other things happening in the best way possible. I love that. Meditation is such a huge thing for me. So I loved, I loved reading that. Do you like guided meditation? Like what's your... What's your poison, I guess? Yeah, and I've kind of like evolved over time, but where I'm at now is I've been using Insight Timer for a That's while my now. Rat. Yeah. Yes. So I love Insight Timer and it's one of those that, you know, when you're not yeah. using it, you're like, Oh, I should get rid of the subscription on my phone and then you're like, No. Um, because it really I love that you can have those really amazing guided ones and they let you bookmark yeah. them. So, you know, if you're needing that boost of what I would say like uh, perspective outlook shift, yeah. which we all do often yeah. where you're like, mm, well, I think I need a little input from yeah. another source. Yeah. Uh, it's really great for that as well as when you just need to sit and listen to birds chirp or anything like that and just sit yeah. calmly for 10 minutes. And so that one I think is a, a huge, awesome um, asset to be able to have in your pocket. Yeah. Have you uh, read much or learned much about Joe Dispenza? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in a ma digital entrepreneur mastermind, and ah. um, a lot of them have worked closely with him, and you know, yeah. um, worked closely with Tony Robbins and all yeah. those, you know, kind of that whole circle. And so, I've heard, you know, so much and learned so much from them, but haven't been yeah. able to, um, you know, work directly with any of them. But yeah, yeah, there's a lot there. There's so much, and I've yeah. been doing a lot of his meditations, and they are yeah. they're quite powerful. So if you yeah. haven't done them, I would definitely recommend checking yeah. them out. Yeah. Really, yeah. Well, um, the amount of, and that's where, once again, I mean, I think the next 10, 20 years is going to be really fascinating for the amount of insight that we're going to gain from, you know, um, from psilocybin to yeah. different brain thing. I mean, there's a lot, I think that we're going to learn. Um, and I'm very intrigued and excited to see what comes of all that. As am I. I love that. Yeah. So where can our listeners learn more from you? Well, the the best place is Instagram at KT Mary and at KT Mary Education for those of you that are looking for kind of our upcoming workshops, master classes, teachings, you name it. Um, and then same thing online. We're just ktmary.com and ktmaryeducation.com. And you can learn. We've got a lot of great free resources there. We've got a lot of great blog posts and things. So um, definitely check that out where you can learn more. I love that. So I love to end my interviews just with this last question. And it sure. is, what are you currently curious about or artistically curious about? Oh, gosh, there's a long list, so I should narrow it down. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm always really exploring in in different niches and different locations and things like that. And um, there's there's a few things, but you mentioned TikTok earlier, and I'm slightly curious about that. It's so um, fun. It's yeah. so fun. <laughs> So it's, it's something I don't, I will be like jumping on that platform and, and creating content like crazy anytime soon, but I'm definitely curious to kind of explore what our brand's interpretation of that could be. Yeah. Um, and, and really getting back to some of our passion projects and yeah. um, creating for our different um, fine art print shops. And because that content is really uh, just a different kind of muscle of yeah. just allowing us to, to kind of dream a little bit and go shoot things just for the sake of being creative and creating yeah. beautiful imagery. And so those things right now are just, it's nice to have a bit of white space to dabble in some new projects just to flex those creative and curious muscles. So yeah. I think that part sounds fun. Love it. Well, mm -hmm. Katie, th thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate it. And Look forward to continuing to listen um, and all, all of your great interviews and explorations. So thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, my beautiful friends, I hope you loved this conversation just as much as I did. I am sending you so much of my light and my love today and every single day. We'll see you next time.